morning and welcome to the live radio broadcast of New Baptist Church located at 61028th Street in Huntington. You could come join us this morning at 11 o'clock for our morning worship service. And we have evening services on Wednesday that start at 630 for everyone except the children in the youth group start at six o'clock. So the adults, you can come and you can socialize while you get your kids here early and get to know each other better before the Bible study start at 630. Will you join us as Jim leads us in prayer? Good morning. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much um, for your son Jesus, who not only died, but he arose that we could have eternal life with him. Lord, I thank you for this beautiful day, Lord. It's just uh, a great day to come out to church, Sunday school and church, and worship you and give you praise and honor, Lord. Lord, I thank you for the those who are listening um, on the radio today and just ask you to be with um, Pastor Robin as he brings the message uh, this morning. We ask that you would uh, be with our singers um, throughout the, the church today. And Lord, we'd ask that your Holy Spirit would be in this room, Lord. Uh, with those listening, you said that when two or more are gathered in your name, you're there with us. And we praise you and thank you for that. Lord, we'd ask that you be with all the pastors throughout the world that proclaim your word today, Lord. Be with the uh, churches that, that are underground and that it, it's not possible to worship in the open, Lord. Just ask your Holy Spirit be with them. Be with our country, Lord. We uh, lift it up to you. We thank you that you have blessed us in so many ways. Lord, be with us today and watch over us and help us to be a reflection of your love and your light. Please forgive us of our sins and in thought, word, and deed. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you, Jim. Our message this morning in song is Kurt and Zach. I guess Kurt's singing because he doesn't have his guitar and Zach's playing. <laughs> Because 
He didn't leave me the way he found me. He didn't leave me the way that he found me. He didn't leave me to die. Thank you so much, Kurt and Zach. Really appreciate that. Love it when you guys get to come up here and do a duo together. Our message this morning is Pastor Robin. Oh, and let me add my word of welcome uh, to that. That uh, You just heard I am Robin Crouch, one of the pastors here at New Baptist Church. and It's our joy to uh, be with you again today and to do this each week as we uh, do that. And uh, I would just say that if you like what you heard, uh, you can come to our 11 o'clock service this morning, get to hear something like that again. Uh, and uh, uh, they, uh, uh, just a wonderful time. And again, uh, if you're looking for a church home, uh, we are located at 610 28th Street here in Huntington. That's uh, the old uh, ice skating rink, and it's now behind uh, uh, there across from the old East High School and uh, behind the St. Mary's property there. Uh, we'd love to have you come and join us again, 11 o'clock on Sunday mornings. Uh, and uh, then at, uh, at 6 o'clock on Wednesdays, our children and youth begin and our adult Bible studies at 6.30. Uh, as I've shared with you before, we do uh, archive all of these uh, services, this class, and also our church uh, worship services on our uh, church YouTube page. And you can find a link to that at uh, newbaptistchurch.com. Today we continue the series of lessons uh, from the lives of people in the Bible. Uh, as we do that, uh, just uh, let's begin this way. Paul Borthwick in his book, 101 Ways to Simplify Your Life, tells this story. It says African missionaries hired local villagers to help uh, carry supplies to a distant station. Now, the locals went at a slower pace than the missionaries desired, and so the missionaries pushed them to go faster. Uh, on day three of the trek, the group went twice as far as they went on day two, and around the campfire evening, the missionaries were congratulating themselves on their great uh, leadership abilities about how they pushed uh, the locals to go faster and faster and faster. But on day four, that morning, the locals, the workers wouldn't budge. Uh, well, what's wrong, asked the missionary. We did so much better yesterday than today, or the day before, and uh, everybody looks like they feel well. Why are we not moving? And the leader of the locals said this. He said, we went so quickly yesterday that we must wait here for our souls to catch up with us. How many of us feel like our lives go that way? You know, we have the most sophisticated technologies in history. Uh, and we have them to help us save time, to manage time, to make time, to keep time, to avoid losing or wasting time. Yet in spite of being surrounded by all those kind of devices, that technology, we're working harder and longer than ever. We have more tools or toys to enrich our leisure, but no time to enjoy them. We have the most elaborate kitchens in the world, but we only use the refrigerator and the microwave, <laughs> preferring to graze like animals 
rather than to dine like families. Our lives are hectic and are described by those two illustrations, either going so fast our souls don't have time to catch up or wasting so much time or being in such a hurry, we prefer to graze rather than to die. I believe that Nehemiah will give us some help so that we can thrive spiritually rather than just survive. So if you have your copy of God's Word, you can turn with me to Nehemiah chapter 2. Uh, and we're going to begin reading in verse 11. Follow along as I read. Starting in verse 11 of chapter 2 of the book of Nehemiah. So I went to Jerusalem and was there three days. Then I arose in the night, and I and a few men with me, and I told no one what my God had put into my heart to do in Jerusalem. There was no animal with me but the one on which I rode. I went out by night by the valley gate to the dragon spring and to the dung gate, and I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. Then I went on to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal that was under me to pass. Then I went up in the night by the valley and inspected the wall, and I turned back and entered by the valley gate and so returned. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, and I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, and the rest uh, who were to do the work. Then I said to them, You see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned? Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. And I told them of the hand of my God, uh, I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good and also for the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. Pray with me, would you? Again, our Father, we give you thanks for the opportunity of being in this place of gathering around your word. Lord, I thank you for the medium of radio that allows us to be together each week at this time. I pray now that you would use your word in us this uh, this event uh, from the life of Nehemiah. Oh God, that we use his story to inform our stories. And oh God, that you'd open our spiritual eyes and ears to see and to hear what you have for us today. Open our hearts to understand it. And Lord, give us courage in our wills to obey you. Oh God, we love you. We want to be people who reflect you in this world. Now do your work in us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if we begin to look at Nehemiah, uh, we need to take just a step back and find out how did we get where we are in this story. You see, in 606 B.C., the Israelites were taken captive by the Babylonians, and the captivity would last 70 years. The Israelites began returning home when the balance of power shifted toward the Medes and the Persians. The Persian rulers included a line of kings that allowed the Jews and other aliens to repopulate their homelands. First, a group of about 50,000 exiles returned home to Jerusalem in 536 B.C. under Zerubbabel's leadership. You can read that story in Ezra, the Bible book of Ezra, in chapters 1 to 6. Ezra then led a second wave nearly 80 years later, and that's what you find in Ezra chapters 7 through 10. And then the final exodus followed 13 years later under Nehemiah. Now, Ezra led the people in a spiritual revival and supervised the reconstruction of the temple. But Jerusalem's walls remained largely in ruin, even though there had been some effort to repair them. Now, Nehemiah grew up in the Hebrew faith while living in Babylon. And during his time, uh, he became cupbearer to King Artaxerxes of Persia. And it was there, as the cupbearer and in the king's presence, that he began to hear the great stress his countrymen were encountering in Judea. You can see that in chapter 1, verse 3 of the book of Nehemiah. Now, neighboring nations were doing just as they pleased. 
to the defenseless city of Jerusalem, robbing or killing at will. And Nehemiah went and asked the king to allow him to return to his homeland and to rebuild the walls. Well, the king granted his request uh, with the caveat that Nehemiah would come back and serve him again. Nehemiah went to Jerusalem to survey the situation and he began the process of rebuilding the walls. And that's what we just read in verses 11 through 18 of chapter 2. The walls would not only serve as security, but would enable them to redevelop their national and individual spiritual identity without being uh, interrupted or disrupted from the outside. Now, if after surveying the city, examining the walls, and after some great opposition from outside, uh, it wasn't uh, done in a vacuum, and it wasn't done without some resistance. Uh, Nehemiah rallies the people to rebuild the wall, and in chapter 6, verse 15, it says, they got the whole task done in 52 days. Wouldn't that be nice on route on Interstate 64 if it had only been oh, 52 days? God. 52 years. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. You all may not hear this on the radio, but someone here says that it might maybe 52 years. Uh, but it just really, I mean, when you think about that, the walls around the city, and, and, that, and Jerusalem wasn't as big at that time as it is today, but uh, I don't care who you are, building a wall, and doing it around a whole city in 52 days is a pretty uh, monumental task. And that's what was done. But Nehemiah, after the wall was built, honored what he said to the king, and he went back to serve in the king's court. Uh, in his absence, though, after Nehemiah left, uh, the people began to abuse the Sabbath, the day of worship and rest. When Nehemiah returns and he, Nehemiah gets permission to come back, he confronts the leaders with their failure and then restores the Sabbath principle to the people's lives, and that's the latter chapters of Nehemiah. You see, for Nehemiah, rebuilding the wall brought physical protection for the people, but reestablishing the Sabbath principle protected them spiritually. Both need to be considered. And so as we look at what can we learn here, we need to look at both of those, what kind of physical walls or those structural things do we need to have in place? And then uh, to protect who we are and allow us to be who God wants us to be, all those things. But then how do we protect our spiritual lives uh, and our understanding uh, of walking with God together. Again, for Nehemiah, it was physical walls around the city for protection and uh, the Sabbath principle for the spiritual undertaking. So we live, though, in a world much like Nehemiah's. Our cities are not safe havens anymore. Uh, you know, it is, it is striking to me how in the last, just in the last year, year and a half, it seems like almost daily here in Huntington, Charleston area, we're hearing of a shooting somewhere. Uh, all kinds of violence and our cities just aren't safe. Sound familiar? Jerusalem wasn't safe. But also we have abused the Sabbath principle. It was Gordon Dahl who remarked this. He said, we tend to, we tend to worship our work, work at our play, and play at our worship. Let me say that again. We tend to worship our work, work at our play, and play at our worship. And then we wonder why we're so stressed, why we're so fretful, uneasy, and unsettled. And is it because that we have broken down the walls that surround our day of worship, our day of rest, and our lives? Are we in the condition we're in because we have broken walls around us? Now, the Sabbath principle is very simple. Uh, you work six and you reserve the seventh for a day of worship and rest. That one day 
is holy to the Lord. Now, let me say, and I don't want to get into this controversy about the Sabbath. Uh, I hear uh, people in churches everywhere talk about, we're glad to be here and we're Sunday morning on the Sabbath, and Sunday's not the Sabbath. It's always been Saturday. It always will be Saturday. That's what it was in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, the church began to worship on Sunday morning in honor of the resurrection. We didn't call it the Sabbath. We worshiped in honor of the resurrection. We have, in our language, began uh, to use it, and I think using it incorrectly. But the principle, I think, still holds. We have, uh, I have friends, I don't know about you all, but I have some friends who are Seventh-day Baptists. Uh, and uh, they uh, worship on Saturday. And they don't do anything else on Saturday. I had uh, a couple in our church when I was pastor in, in Wheeling who came from that tradition. And, that's, uh, and they came from up in central West Virginia where you can find some. And uh, they came and they would not work on Saturdays. Saturday was the Sabbath. Now they came and worshiped with us on Sunday. But then they would go to work Sunday afternoon. Uh, and continue doing what they did. But they, uh, uh, it was just incredible. But they kept the Sabbath. Most of us look to Sunday now as our day of rest. But it's not the Sabbath. But it fulfills the Sabbath principle. It's just the same. Now the people in Nehemiah's day had forgotten their commitment to this principle, and their lives suffered for it. Spiritually, they were far from God. And I wonder just how many of us are suffering from that same fate today. Because we abuse the Sabbath principle, our hearts are far from God, and we look and we think, I don't know what happened. I don't know what's going on. I wonder how many of us suffer because of that. Well, how do we rebuild the walls? Well, like Nehemiah, it takes work. Uh, in um, the United Airlines, uh, some years ago in their hemispheres, you know, the magazine they have that you can pull up and if you're taking a flight, had an article by Tom Mueller uh, about the walls around cities in ancient Roman Empire. And the author pictured stone rings sprouting like mushrooms encircling cities in a firm embrace that would both protect them from their enemies uh, uh, who might turn and protect them from turning in on themselves also. The ancient walls provided a sacred boundary that divided civilized society from wilderness and a realm of peace from that realm of war. The walls offered protection and safety. And that's what walls are designed to do, to offer for us protection and safety. The walls at my house offer me protection and safety from the weather outside and from those who would seek to do me harm. At, at least uh, they have to get through the alarm system and the locked door and those kind of things. You see, walls offer protection. The opportunity to develop a spiritual life that pleases the Lord comes from those walls we build that we set up. Now, the walls that we set up in our lives are not to keep us from influencing other people, but it's those structures that allow us to grow spiritually. We can rebuild sacred walls to protect our spiritual lives. And these walls are our commitments to the Lord, but more than building them, <laughs> we need to keep them. And we need to maintain them. The resolve to keep some things sacred and not to violate it. Uh, we are in the midst today, I guess, is the last day of the Olympics and the closing ceremony will be tonight. But let me ask you, can any of you name uh, the winner of the 100-yard dash in the 1924 Olympics? I wonder if you know who did not run that day. 
if you've seen the movie Cherry to Fire, you know it was Eric Liddell. He refused to run on that day because it was being run on Sunday. And he simply said he couldn't run on a day that God had told him it was a day of rest. He had just set a world record in the 400 meter run. Raymond Berker writes, I don't know how many others in the stadium understood the kind of Christian conviction that had caused Eric to forfeit the, other, the earlier race. But I understood instinctively, for I shared his beliefs. In fact, my brother and I had made the same decision in 1920 in the Olympic trials. The meet was on Sunday, and we decided the Lord wouldn't be pleased if we broke the Sabbath day's rest, so we declined. For Eric and for my brother and me, it was much more than following a simple belief. It was a conviction that our running was for one purpose only, to give glory to God. They built a wall and it held, and it brought glory to God. Now, we don't have those kinds of things going on much anymore. In fact, you get youth sports, they start on Sundays. I remember growing up here in Huntington, uh, Nothing happened on Wednesday nights or Sundays, at least not till after church time on Sunday. But Wednesday night was a church night. No Little League games. That's changed. So as we come to the close of the lesson, I want you to first reflect on this. What spiritual areas need the protection of a spiritual wall? What walls need to be built or rebuilt or at least renewed, spending time in God's word, talking with God, we call that prayer, developing meaningful relationships with other Christians, we call that fellowship. You see, in Christ, we find the reason and source for putting up these sacred walls. In him, we have forgiveness of sin and new life. But with those come an obligation to live according to his word. You see, it's not just fire insurance. We're called to follow. Uh, something that, uh, as I begin to reflect on that, uh, you know, nowhere did Jesus call people just to come and be baptized. He said to follow. As we live with the protection these spiritual walls provide, we cannot be like the Israelites and neglect the Sabbath principle. Again, remember, you work six, you rest one. Rest, reflect, and it's held holy for the Lord. So the question is, what commitments or walls will you begin to build this morning? And remember, those commitments are personal between you and the Lord. Now, you can share them if you choose. And maybe you need to share them. But they are personal. Let's build some walls. Let's keep the Sabbath. Let's protect our spiritual lives and be who God has called us to be. Pray with me. Our Father, I give you thanks for the morning. I thank you for the truth that comes from your word. I thank you for examples like Nehemiah. Oh God, teach us to live this way, to protect our spiritual lives with walls we build, with structures with disciplines we build that allow us to grow closer to you. And then, oh God, make us ever mindful of the need for a day to renew and reflect and to keep holy to you. Oh God, again, we give you thanks. Now do your work in us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.